Man, man, man. I am so excited to be at Fresh Life Church this morning. Is anybody else excited to be here? As I was so kindly introduced, my name is Charlie Hughes. I am from a church called Church by the Glades. Uh, my dad is the pastor of that church. His name is Pastor David Hughes. He's preached here at Fresh Life Church before. We love Fresh Life. I consider you all family. I'm your family from Florida. You did not even know that you had. And I'm so glad to be here. Um, I lead the young adult ministry at that church called Rally. So shout out to all my friends from Rally that may be watching this right now. So for 18 to 30 year olds, so if you're ever in the area in South Florida, and come check out Rally. But um, really, I, this is just a, a pinch me kind of moment because this, this feels like a dream. This ministry has impacted me so much throughout the years. And I look up to your pastors, Pastors Levi and Jenny Lusco so much. Don't you guys love the Lusco family? They're some of the best people. And I said this in the other service, but I mean it, so I'm going to say it again. You ever heard that cliche saying where it goes, never meet your heroes because they're going to disappoint you and let you down? I could not disagree with that statement more because before I ever even knew the Luscos, I looked up to them, and they've exceeded every expectation I could ever have for them. I think the world would be a better place if we could all learn to love like the Luscos, some of the most kind, genuine, and godly people I've ever met. And I love the Luscos more than Pastor Levi loves space. That is the truth. That's a big claim. I know it is. I love them that much. They're, they're my heroes. You guys ready for the Word of God this morning? <laughs> Open up your Bibles, turn in your Bibles, turn on your Bibles. We are going to be in the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings. I love the book of 1 Kings. Specifically, we'll be in chapters 18 and 19. Yes, yes, yes. It's important that you know and understand that the protagonist of our story this morning is a man that goes by the name of the prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, the prophet Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a competition. In this competition, the prophet Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, here's what we're going to do. You 450 prophets of Baal will set up an altar to the God that you worship, and I will set up an altar to the God that I worship. And whichever one of us can call on the name of their God and get their God to rain down fire from heaven to consume the altar that they prepared with flames, with fire, will win the competition by proving that their God is the one true God. The 450 prophets of Baal went first in this competition. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26, says this. The prophets of Baal called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there is no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder than that, he scoffed, for surely he, Baal, is God. Perhaps he's daydreaming. Maybe he's distracted. Maybe he's dozing off in the space. Maybe he's just not paying attention. Or maybe Baal is relieving himself. Do you understand what's being said here? <laughs> Saying maybe Baal is a little preoccupied. Maybe Bill is using the little God's room. Maybe Bill's on the toilet. Or maybe Bill is on a trip. He's out of the office. He's on vacation. He's not taking calls right now. He cannot be bothered. Or maybe Bill is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they, the prophets of Baal, shouted louder and following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Then, when it was the prophet Elijah's turn to call upon the name of the God that he worshipped to consume the altar that he prepared with fire, with flames, it says that he did this. He had the people there watching this competition take place take large jugs, large jars, large receptacles full of water and pour the water in these jars on the altar he prepared not once, not twice, but three separate times. And this is weird. This is funny. This is fascinating because this seems counterproductive. He wants his God to consume this altar with fire, but yet he drenched it, he soaked it, he covered it with water. You see, by doing this, Elijah was doing two things. One, he was making a statement about the greatness and the power of his God. While two, he was continuing to mock, taunt, and trash talk the prophets of Baal. <laughs> by soaking this altar with water, Elijah was essentially saying, the wetter, the better. I got that line from Pastor Levi. It was too good not to use. 
The wetter the better. Because my God is going to prove himself to you today. My God is going to prove his power to you today. My God is going to prove to you today that he is the one true and only almighty and living God. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36, it says that Elijah prayed to his God, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. The faith, the boldness, the courage, the confidence of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18 is undeniable and nothing short of amazing. Elijah was about that action. He wanted all the smoke, am I right? I guess you can say Elijah came ready to rumble. Look to the person you're sitting next to, whatever campus you may be watching from or maybe type in the chat online. Ask them the question, are you ready to rumble? Well, I'm serious. Ask the person you're sitting next to, are you ready to rumble? You want to know if the person you're sitting next to is ready to rumble because the title of this sermon is Fight for Faithfulness. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah was certainly and clearly ready to rumble. He was ready to fight for faithfulness. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, we see a different side of Elijah. We see a side, we see a version of Elijah that is not so bold. That is not so cool, calm, or collected. We see a side of Elijah that is not quite as courageous. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we see a side and a version of Elijah that is different from 1 Kings chapter 18 in that Elijah no longer operates out of faith, but rather he operates out of fear. This is because when Queen Jezebel heard what Elijah had done to the prophets, the God she worshipped, she sent a messenger to him saying in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 2, May the gods deal with me, Queen Jezebel, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. If by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that one of the prophets you killed, if by this time tomorrow your head is not off your body. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. I think now is the appropriate point in the sermon to state the obvious. Faithfulness is not easy. Faithfulness is difficult. Faithfulness is a challenge. Faithfulness is not something you can accomplish by accident. Faithfulness is not something that necessarily comes naturally to us as human beings. In fact, I say when push comes to shove, faithfulness is something that we all suck at and struggle with. Because scripture says, for all have sinned and for all fall short of the glory of God. This means that no one is perfect. No one is flawless. No one is shooting 100% from the field. At one point or another, we have all failed at being faithful. And for this reason, faithfulness is a fight. Faithfulness is a fight because it is one of the different and difficult struggles and troubles of life through overwhelming, all-consuming, and never-ending that we'll feel most tempted to run. Most tempted to quit. Most tempted to flee. Most tempted to give up, to give in, to say, I'm done. I'm out. This is not what I wanted. This is not what I was expecting. This is not what I thought I was starting up for. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for having me. But deuces. Because it is when failure and pain seem inevitable and unavoidable that fleeing from the fight for faithfulness will seem most attractive, seem most appealing, and feel most instinctual. The fight for faithfulness is a fight that every single person under the sound of my voice right now will have to choose at one point or another in their life to either run to or run from. Attack or avoid. 
face or flee. I'm only 21 years old, but something that I started to consider when I feel like fleeing from the different fights for faithfulness that God has called me to is what's worse, the initial dangers and discomforts of fighting for faithfulness or the possibility and potential of becoming someone who in 10, 20, 30, or 40 years has to look back over their life and wonder what if. What if? What if I would have stuck around? What if I would have stuck with it? What if I hadn't given in? What if I hadn't given up? What if I hadn't quit? What if I hadn't given up on that dream? What if I hadn't quit that job? What if I hadn't let that person walk away? What if I hadn't got a divorce? What if I would have stayed and what if I would have fought? What I've learned from listening to those that I love and look up to ask the question, what if, is that fleeing from the fight for faithfulness never leads to freedom. Yes. It only leads to frustration because it makes you feel like a failure. Yes. If fear is driving you, and if fear is directing you, then fear is also defining you. The fight for faithfulness is not a fight for the faint of heart, but it is in fact a fight worth fighting because it is a fight for your identity. It is a fight for your purpose. It is a fight for your potential. It is a fight for your future. It is a fight for you to one day step in and become who God has created and called you to be. It is a fight for you one day to stand before the maker of heaven and earth and hopefully hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And with all this being said, the fight for faithfulness starts with making a commitment. Look to somebody you're sitting next to and tell them with some attitude, you better make a commitment. <laughs> I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning, washes their face, looks at themselves in the mirror and says to themselves, I'm going to do the best I can to be as noncommittal, <laughs> undevoted, and as unfaithful as I possibly can be today. No one does that, right? This is not the reason why so many people fail at being faithful. I think and I believe that the reason why so many people fail at being faithful is because too often people associate their faith with their feelings. Wow. Don't get me wrong. I think your faith very much can and should involve your feelings. But if you are looking for your feelings to fuel, sustain, or carry your faith, I'm sorry, but I have to inform you that very soon you're going to end up feeling empty, exhausted, and disappointed because being faithful is not about being comfortable. Being faithful is not about being certain in order to trust God. Being faithful is not about finding a time that's most convenient for you in order to obey God. No, faithfulness is not about coziness. Faithfulness is about commitment. The foundation of your faith needs to be something more solid and more substantial than your feelings. Because feelings change. Moods change. Emotions, they come and they go. The foundation of your faith needs to be a decision, a commitment you make to remain in the fight no matter what. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're in the middle of, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter how you may feel. This is why James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 tells us, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work within you so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I'm going to be honest with you. The fight for faithfulness is going to be tough at times, but I also want to encourage you this morning. Tough times don't last but people with tough and tenacious commitments to their faith too. Just as pressure creates diamonds, God can use the problems in your life to produce within you the useful understanding, the mental muscle, and the spiritual strength that you need to rise above what is going on around you. Don't be a person of emotion. Be a person of devotion. The reason why Elijah's faith, boldness, and confidence seem to be missing in 1 Kings chapter 19 is because he followed the direction of his feelings. Verse 8 tells us that Elijah traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. This is nearly 100 miles from where he originally began. It's crazy where your fear will take you. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him asking a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, but the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, 
and put your props to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. This is the great and mighty prophet Elijah speaking. This is the man that God himself anointed and appointed to be his messenger to the ancient kingdoms of his day. This is the man that just a chapter earlier took out 450 prophets by himself in one. This is the man that just 40 some odd days earlier prompted the almighty God to rain down fire from heaven. But yet now he responds to God's question of what are you doing here, Elijah, by focusing on all that has gone wrong. By focusing on all that has gone bad. By focusing on all that is now against him. By focusing on how he was alone. And the implications of Elijah's answer to God's question, him focusing on how he was by himself, it implies that because Elijah believes he's by himself, he believes he's not enough. Because Elijah believes he's by himself, he believes he's doomed. Because Elijah believes he's by himself, he believes it's not a question of if, but of when. He's caught and he's killed. But you know what's kind of weird about the way Elijah answered God's question? He did not directly answer the question. I suppose that you could argue in an indirect way he kind of answered God's question, but God did not ask Elijah, where is everyone else? God did not ask Elijah, where are all the other prophets? God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? And I would argue that the implications of God asking this question are even more significant than the implications of Elijah's answer. God is all-knowing. This means that God does not need to ask any questions in order to receive or obtain new information. So God asking Elijah a question most likely means that God was trying to get Elijah to realize and recognize something about himself and about his situation. The question, what are you doing here, Elijah, it implies that Elijah is not where he is supposed to be. And because Elijah is not where he is supposed to be, this means that Elijah is probably not doing what God has called him to do. And because Elijah is not doing what God has called him to do, this means that Elijah is not being who God has called him to be. And because Elijah is not being who God has called him to be, Elijah has forgotten who he is. Some of you listening, different campuses, online or here in this room, if you would be honest with yourself, you would admit that you've been fleeing from the different fights for faithfulness that God has called you to. And because of this, you feel alone, you feel scared, and you feel afraid. This is because when you flee, you forget who you are. And I know some of you are facing very real problems, trying to pay your bills, your mortgage, you, you have loved ones in the hospital, maybe you yourself are, are fighting some type of terminal illness. I'm try not trying to make less of what you're going through. And I'm not trying to compare my problems to yours. But in my own life, there are times when I feel like fleeing from the different fights for faithfulness that God has called me to. As I've already told you, I'm a college student. I'm about to enter in my senior year. So I'm, thank you. I'm happy about that too. And I, I got my eyes fixed on the finish line, but it can still feel like I'm so far away. As I told you, I lead Rally, the young adult movement of my church, and I love leading Rally. It's one of my favorite things that I get to do, but it also comes with a lot of responsibility. And I preach regularly at my church and at other churches, just like I'm doing so right now. And preaching is one of the greatest joys of my life, but there's also a lot of preparation, hard work, and time that goes into delivering a sermon. I consider all these different things going on in my life to be blessings, but it is when the different responsibilities for these different things going on in my life pile on top of one another that these blessings can begin to feel like burdens. It can all begin to feel like so much, too much, more than I can handle. It can begin to feel so overwhelming and it can get so out of control. And sometimes I start to believe that maybe my best option is just to flee from it all. I begin to think maybe I should just drop out of school. I begin to believe that maybe there's someone else out there who's more experienced and more equipped to be leading rally. I begin to believe that maybe there's someone else who knows more about the Bible and who's 
a more polished preacher and communicator who'd be more well suited to be preaching to people right now than I am because right now I feel like I'm not the one. Right now I feel like I'm not the man for the job. Right now I feel like I'm so alone. I feel like I'm by myself and I feel like I'm not enough. I just feel like fleeing from it all. And whenever I have these different feelings of fleeing, I always express them to my dad. Not only is my dad my father and my pastor, but he's my best friend, my hero, my greatest encourager. And without fail, whenever I express these different feelings of fleeing to my dad, in some way, shape, or form, in one way or another, my dad always responds to me by asking me the question, Charlie, what are you doing here? What are you doing here thinking such thoughts? What are you doing here believing such things about yourself? And by asking me these different questions of, Charlie, what are you doing here? My father simultaneously reminds me of who I am. Of how I've experienced victories in these different areas of my life in the past. And he reminds me of who God has made me to be. If you are listening and you're self-aware enough to recognize that you've been fleeing from the different fights for faithfulness that God has called you to, I want you to ask yourself the question this morning. What am I doing here? What am I doing here living with fear? What am I doing here living in hopelessness? What am I doing here with regret? What am I doing here with guilt? What am I doing here disappointed? What am I doing here discouraged? What am I doing here doubting myself all the time? What am I doing here dwelling in defeat? And when you answer these different questions of what am I doing here, do not answer these questions by justifying or making excuses why you are where you are. But rather answer these different questions of what am I doing here by reminding yourself of who God has made you to be. Remind yourself that fear cannot be all there is for me. Remind yourself that hopelessness cannot be all there is for me. Remind yourself that guilt, that doubt, that defeat, that depression, that dysfunction, that devastation, that disappointment cannot be all there is for me because God still has a plan for my life. God still has a future for my life. God still has a purpose for my life. I'm the handiwork of God. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I am made in the image of the Almighty. This means that all I have is all I need. This means I'm built for the battle. This means I'm made for the moment. This means that God would not call me to the fight unless God has already created me for the fight. Don't you dare look at the fight for faithfulness in front of you and say to yourself, I can't do it, I can't win, I can't fight because it's just me. It's little old me or I'm by myself. Do you know who you are? You're the one that God called. You're the one that God's chosen. You're the one that God's created for such a time as this. If not you, then who? When you make less of who you are, you are not just doubting and you are not just insulting yourself. You are doubting and you are insulting the one who created and called you. When Elijah responded to God's question of what are you doing or by focusing on all that had gone wrong on how he was by himself, I want to say to Elijah, since when has this ever been a problem for you before? Just a chapter earlier, you took out 450 prophets. Being alone didn't stop you then. Why would it stop you now? And I, I think God was getting kind of frustrated with Elijah also. Because in verse 11, the Lord said to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then how crazy is this? A great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake either. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, asking the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? There's that question again. There's that question, Elijah, what are you doing here? But this time, take notice of how the question is asked. The Lord was not in the great and mighty rushing wind. The Lord was not in the blazing flames of the fire. The Lord was not in the crushing force of the earthquake. No, but rather, the Lord spoke to Elijah through the sound 
of a gentle, subtle, quiet whisper. The reason God spoke to Elijah through a whisper is not because God was looking to make a statement about his power. The reason God spoke to Elijah through a whisper is because God was looking to make a statement about his proximity. When someone is far from you, a great distance from you, they have to shout at you. They have to scream at you. They have to yell at you. They have to raise their voice in your direction just for you to be able to hear them. This is why the lies of the enemy seem so loud sometimes. Because the devil cannot get close to you like you would like to. Because the devil cannot destroy you like you would like to. Because the devil cannot put his hands on you like you would like to. He settles for throwing lies at you. Shouting things like, screaming things like, yelling things like, you're not enough. You don't have what it takes. You're not gifted, you're not qualified, you're not equipped, you're not experienced enough. So don't even try. Don't even fight. Because you're going to lose. You think God can ever love you? <laughs> you think God can ever want a relationship with you? You think God can ever use dysfunctional and broken you? Do you know who you are? The mistakes you made, the lies you told, the sins you committed, the messes you made, the problems you caused. Have you read your resume? Are you aware of your criminal history? God gave up on you a long time ago. So you might as well give up on you too. But fresh life. I think God has brought me all the way from South Florida to the mountains of Montana to let you know there is no reason for the Lord to shout. There is no reason for the Lord to raise his voice. There is no reason for the Lord to yell. There is no reason for the Lord to scream, but rather he whispers because he is near. He whispers because he is close. He whispers because he's in close proximity to you. He's right there with you. He's by your side. He has never left you and he's forsaken you. He whispers because he is near to you. Take a seat for just a moment. In high school, I was not the strongest guy. I was not the tallest guy. I was not the biggest guy. I was not the most muscular person. But this did not affect my confidence one bit. Now, I would say almost anything that came to my mind. Sometimes I'd say a little bit too much, but I'll leave that there. I will not get into the details. We are in church right now. I would walk around with some confidence, with some swagger, some pep in my step, but I would not walk like this and talk like this because I was particularly secure in who I was. Nah, that wasn't it at all. I would walk like this and I would talk like this because I knew, I recognized who I was rolling with. You gotta understand, in high school, my friend group, my squad, my boys, my brothers, the people I would hang with was the varsity basketball team. And they were state champions. Our team was good. We were nationally ranked. Our whole starting five went on to play ball at the next level, a lot of them Division I. Now, I was not on the basketball team, 
I was their team manager and got fired twice somehow. I don't even know how that happens, <laughs> but it did. These are just my guys. I love them. They love me. We still talk. We keep in contact to this day when we're all in town. We'll hang out. I think I have some pictures of me and my, my friends. Yeah, which one of these does not look like the other? <laughs> They're great guys, but in high school, we were a funny looking crew because it went me and I'm six foot on a good day. And then it went six foot five JB, six foot seven Solomon, six foot ten Big E, and seven foot Victor. In high school, I knew that if I ever got in any type of trouble, <laughs> in high school, I knew that if I ever got in any type of bad way, in high school, I knew that if I ever got in any type of bad situation with some bad people, I knew my brothers would have my back. I knew my brothers would be by my side. I knew my brothers would be about that action. So I wasn't afraid of anyone. I fear no man because I knew I recognized who I was rolling with. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6 say, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Because the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, the confidence of God, the strength that God which transcends and surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now let me take you to the Old Testament. In the words of the Psalms in Psalm chapter 139, verses 7 through 10, it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. I'm trying to tell somebody at Fresh Life Church this morning, here at the last session of Movement Conference, that when you recognize who you're rolling with, when you recognize that the Lord is near, when you recognize that the Creator is close, when you recognize that the Savior of the world is by your side, no matter what fight you may find yourself in, you'll begin to realize that your battle is already won. You'll begin to realize that I'm already doing my fight from the side of victory. You'll begin to realize realize that the battle is not mine to lose, but the battle is, my, is the Lord's to win. Because if God is with me, who dare be against me? If God is for me, then what weapon formed against me can prosper? If God is with me, then greater is he that is fighting with me than he who is fighting against me. With God on your side, you don't have to run. You don't have to quit. You don't have to settle. You don't have to stop short. You don't have to submit to sin. But oh, you can fight. You can fight with boldness. You can fight with courage. You can fight with confidence. Strength, swagger, you can rejoice in your rumbling. You can be bold in your battling. You can be courageous in your conquering. And you can have faith in your fighting. Because if the Lord is near, then you have no choice but to see a victory. Somebody give God some praise in this place. If you know it's true, if you know he's with you, and he's never left you, and he's right there with you. There's one last thing that I want to tell you. Belief for better. Where you are is not all there is. This story finishes by God telling Elijah that if you would just go back to where you were, you would discover that there are 7,000 others just like you. Elijah thought he was by himself, but God was with him, and there is more waiting for him. There is still more to your story. You are not your greatest mistake. You are not the worst sin you've ever committed. You are not your worst wrongdoing. God loves you. He desires a relationship with you. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. If you still have a breath in your lungs, God is not done with you yet. He still has a future for you. He still has a plan for you. He still has a purpose for your life. So remember who you are. Recognize who you're rolling with. Make a commitment if you haven't already. If you're here today, watching online or watching from one of the other campuses and you have never made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, if you've never made that commitment, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. That's the best commitment, the best decision you can ever make. I want you to know that Jesus, he lived for you. He suffered for you. He died for you because he loves you. 
And when he died on that cross 2,000 years ago, you know what else died with him? Your sin, your guilt, your shame, and the punishment you deserve. But three days later, after his death, your sin stay in the grave. Your guilt stay in the grave. Your shame stay in the grave. The punishment you deserve, that stayed dead. But you know what did not stay dead? Jesus. He rose with all authority and all power and all glory in heaven and on earth to offer you his saving grace so you can live all your days with purpose, recognizing that you're rolling with the one who cannot be stopped, the one who has never taken an L, the one who has defeated death and conquered the grave. If you want to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, if you want to make that commitment today, if you want to give your life to Christ, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. I'm going to ask everyone in the room, and whatever campus you're watching at, to pray this prayer out loud, repeating after me for the benefit of those making this commitment for the first time. Close your eyes and bow your heads if you would. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe you arose again and are alive right now. Come into my life and save me. Forgive all of my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. I make this commitment to you. In Jesus' name, please keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. If you just made that decision, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One. I'm so proud of you. Two, your life's forever changed. Three, raise your hand if you just made that commitment to Jesus. I'm so proud of you. God bless you. Welcome to the kingdom of heaven. Recognize who you're rolling with. Remember who you are. God made you on purpose and with purpose. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he is right there with you where you are. Fresh Life Church. God bless you.